This is Jackie Tantillo of Should Have Listened to My Mother, and I wanted you to know that this episode of Should Have Listened to My Mother contains some graphic content that some may find disturbing. Hello and welcome to Should Have Listened to My Mother. I'm Jackie Tantillo. Each week, I get an opportunity to talk to different people this week's episode. There's a lot that I know, and then there's a lot that I don't know. And I'm really looking forward to my guest sharing her story with us. I'd like to welcome Lakita Vance Watkins to Should Have Listened to My Mother. Hi, Jackie. So glad you could join me. Lakita lives in the beautiful state of Vermont. I know you through our mutual friends, Christopher Nomura and Judy Nunn. And we've met over the years, wonderful parties together. You are a woman of great intellect and passion and creativity. You are of the arts. How's that? <laughs> That's, I will go with that. But I want to find out what went on when you were a little girl and in your household, what your life was like as a little girl growing up and how did you become the person you are today? Was it in spite of or because of what your childhood was like? Where were you born? Wilburton, Oklahoma, a mined out coal mining town in southwest uh, Oklahoma, about 20 miles from the county seat of McAllister. And how long did you live in Oklahoma? Uh, 10 years. And do you have siblings? No. Mm -mm. What is your mother's name? Mildred. Did you live with your mother and father? No. Uh, my mother, uh, unmarried, 18-year-old, and she left me with her mother when I was about 18 months old. And she went to California, and she left me with her mother, who was a very cruel and violent person. And my mother knew that when she left me there. And, you know, the family stories of, are of her and her sisters, her mother beating them. I mean, we're talking about really serious beatings. And so my mother left me there. And in that situation, and that's where I was uh, until I was 10 years old. So your mother, Mildred, was raised by a mm -hmm. woman who was violent and abusive. And she yes. knew that clearly because she was abused as a child, and she left you knowingly yes. with the same situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, was there a grandfather present? No. No. Oh, uh, he died in right when my mother was 13. He had been in the Army, that would be World War One, and contacted tuberculosis. But he died after he was out of the service, so he didn't get any, there was no benefits. In other words, he wasn't in the service when he died. So when he died, his wife, my mother's mother, was there with four little girls and uh, to take care of and raise them. And that was the situation that was set up when, when I was born. And do you want to put a name to your grandmother or leave it be? Uh, Margaret, Margaret, Marguerite. Some people called her Margaret, but it was spelled Marguerite, and some people called her Marguerite. Uh huh. And do you know if she came from an abusive household as well, your grandmother? Um, no, I don't. I have no idea. Uh, there's, yeah, just, I just have no information there. There was no one of her, of her parents are direct. <laughs> She had cousins, and uh, there was uh, one cousin who lived not far away, and she, her name was Ellie, so she would have been a great aunt. And she was really a nice person, not like, not like my grandmother. Uh, she was a nice person, but she was looked upon as weak because she was nice. And I remember seeing her... Uh, because we would go there sometime, not often, and she uh, 
didn't have any influence or voice. She was just sort of there, but she was she she was not mean. She was not cruel. Uh, none of those things. What is your first memory of being abused? Do you remember? I I have. There is none of it that I remember. It is. It's really interesting because there are stories in the family. That, for instance, my grandmother had a. Suppose it was made from a file. It was a, a big butcher knife. It was must have been twelve or four. Even judging back as a child, she used to give spankings with that because you can imagine if you put your hand back with that. Uh, with the stories about her beating the girls with that, with ironing cords, wet ropes. I mean, the stories were abundant, and I rem- I do not remember a single one of them for me. It's totally not there. Nothing. Not one single bit of it. My mother told me, uh, and I, I don't know why she did, and it was after I was an adult, she had come to visit, and my I was must have been, she said two, but she had left when I was 18, so I must have been between two and three. Why she had come back for a short time, I do not know. And she said my grandmother gave me a $5 bill and put it, I was on a high chair. And I threw it in the floor. My grandmother picked it up and gave it to me. I threw it down again. She said my mother, my grandmother started beating me. She thought my grandmother was going to kill me. And my mother went into convulsions, and that broke the spell. But, of course, I don't remember that. I was very young. But she told me that story, and, the, and it was, in the, you know, between my mother and her two sisters. Uh, there were stories about the beatings and how awful it was and how... All of that, but I absolutely do not remember a single, single bit of it. None. It's just not there. But she left again, your mom, after seeing how you were being treated. She did leave you again with her mom. Well, oh, and she, that must have been a very, very short time. She told me that story. As I said, I, I certainly didn't, didn't know that story, obviously. I didn't remember it, and I had not heard that. I don't know why she chose to, to, uh, to tell me that, but... She went back to California, and it, I can't really say how many times during that 10 years that she was back. I did, at one point, go to California on a train by myself, and that was before I was uh, seven, because at age seven, we moved from the house we were in in town up on, a, I see a farm, a small farm, though where we lived at first was treated like a farm. In other words, all the food, that, all the vegetables and uh, fruit that we had was, was from the garden. So it was treated like a farm. We didn't have a cow there when we moved up on the hill when I was seven. Then we had a cow there, and it was, was called a farm. But, and we had chickens. We had chickens both places. And uh, so sometime before I was seven, I did go on a train by myself to California. I, I saw my mother, but her two sisters. And uh, it would be coming back from there that my aunt and someone else, I have no idea who it was, was bringing me back on a bus. And the story was, I don't remember this, that I got sick. I would motion sickness. They got off and hitchhiked. But what I do remember is that some guy picked them, us up, me being in that back seat, and I guess they went to a, a roadside, what do you call them, roadhouse or something? I just remember being in that back seat and them up front, and it was a very, it was a very scary situation. I, I, I remember that part of that. So then I'm back in Oklahoma again. Just putting you on a train by yourself from Oklahoma to California, maybe at seven years old, is astonishing, let alone the horrific scene you oh, described. Yeah. Um, it. Um, I'm so sorry. That's all. There was I don't have nothing else to say right now, but I'm so sorry. I, I didn't. I didn't look at it that way. Um, I there was something called Traveler's Aid, and when I was put on the train, and the train stopped somewhere. I think it was in uh, New Mexico, Arizona. I got off the train. When I got back on, I got back on the other side of the dining car. I didn't know, but when I was on the wrong train, I was on the right train, and I got the conductor to get my suitcase off and change clothes so that when I got to California and the traveler's aide came to get me, I, 
I didn't fit the description. I mean, I did because I was a girl, whatever age that was, but I changed clothes and, and did not fit the description of the person they had. And then I was there with uh, my Aunt Ruby was in California, and uh, there was some time there, and I, I'm assuming I saw my mother, but it was the aunt, the aunt that I went to first, my Aunt Ruby, to Aunt Viola, and it was Viola and someone else that was bringing me back on the bus when uh, we got off the bus, and whoever the driver who picked us up, that was uh, on that trip when I was returning. So you still, your mom just couldn't deal with raising you herself? Um, she didn't. I mean, I, uh, she, it was never talked about in those terms. That's just the way it was. And before that, that trip I told you about on the train, when I was quite young, uh, so maybe four or five, I have no idea again why I wound up in, in California, but my mother is supposed to be taking care of me. It just didn't work. Mm -hmm. She, uh, my Aunt Ruby was babysitting me. My mother came in and she, she loved to go dancing. And my aunt had been ironing all day in the heat, didn't iron my mother the clothes that she wanted to go dancing. So they got in the fight and that left me without my Aunt Ruby take care of me. And my mother t had a friend who had a little girl about my age we were at her grandparents for a while, and then my mother put me in what I don't know what else to call, but a home, and uh, I mean, a, where there were other children, and uh, I there was a little boy there younger than me. I must have been four or five, and I remember he called me mother. That's interesting because our mutual friend said that I mothered other people. I've never thought of it that way. It just from the very beginning. That was just natural to me. And uh, after I went to Houston at 10, somewhere in that first year or two, I uh, took care of three children, the mother and father. They had a fourth child who was in an iron lung with polio. And I took care of her three kids while she would go to the hospital and visit. Okay, I just so fell that's... into that. Role, I fell in that role naturally. Because you were probably longing for a, a little bit of that nurturing love oh, no. and affection. That it, you just, your heart was so big. I guess that's the first inclination was to go and help little other little children. It did none of that. You know, none of that. It's just I can say it was natural. Mm -hmm. Is I told you when we were talking the other day about me standing in that little house in Oklahoma and knowing there was more, and then eventually, as things after I went to Houston, uh, that that more was the arts. And when I say I knew more, I don't mean that it meant it was a bigger house or better furniture or anything material. The more was the vastness of what is possible. That that's what I felt. Once again, not oh, I would. I never thought at all about my own room or anything like that, or having. Uh, you know, we didn't have running water there. We had a little tap off the back porch where we got uh, just you know w water. So, uh, but I never thought it in those terms. It just naturally there was a some uh, after I went to Houston that was. Then I was with my mother, and so that was another chapter that was not all that great. So at 10 years old, all of a sudden you're going to Houston to be with your mom. My grandmother fell on the ice in February when I was 10 and broke her uh, elbow. And at that point, it could be fixed straight or bent, but she would never be able to move it again. Couldn't work the form, and she said, go call your mother to come get you. And... I did, and in things I can't remember, what I've left out of here, the only thing I had, the only companion, the only other person in my life was my little dog, Snowball, and he was the very same age as I was, got him just at the time that I was born, and uh, I can't remember telling Snowball goodbye. I can't remember any of the, the punishments, any of the beatings. I can remember none of that, none, 
and I can't remember telling Snowball goodbye, but that must have that must have been also a pretty big and traumatic and awful thing. Oh, that's an awful lot for a little a little one. You tell me, is it a blessing or a curse that you don't remember the beatings and the brutality? You know, I've never thought of it in those terms. In fact, I never thought of it at, in those terms at all until we, we started talking about this. Uh, it was just there. That's just however it was. I guess that was my protection. Uh, I don't really even in all those years, 10 years, think that much of, of my grandmother that she was there. I remember things like she a big iron kettle. She made homemade soap in the backyard. But I, I mean, there was certainly no talking, no, uh, you know, no what you would think of as having any kind of, of a decent relationship with No her. camaraderie, no cooking with grandma. No, and, and I, I really, as protection for the child that I was, I hate to ever say anything good about her, but she, we were clean. That's, that's in both families, and I realized how important that was, and she cooked and, and, and did uh, canning. Uh, but no, it was, it was not, you know, there, it's terrible to be alone. I don't know. It, it may be worse to be alone with someone that's cruel and I was always told that I could never do nothing right. And that has so stuck with me that sometimes I even use those same words to myself. You know, I'll do something even simple. I had been putting my, just two days ago, keeping my uh, lipstick in my pocket. I went to get it, it wasn't there, and I tell myself, I, I start berating myself that that, has always stuck with me that I can't do, I can't do nothing right. Oh my gosh. If you were able to talk to your grandmother now, what would you say to her? Oh, I, I have, I have nothing to say. I mean, it's, uh, when I was talking to you and said things that were given, like given knowing that there was more there, uh, one of the things that I was given, I don't feel retaliatory. I don't No, I, I have nothing to say to her. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it just, that isn't even an issue. But when I went to Houston, even though the situation with my mother and the man she was married to at the moment, that, that was not great, but it was just a new life for me. We, uh, they were in a, a house with my mother's husband's brother and his wife, and they had a daughter my age. And I just, we just, we just, it was just fine from the beginning. We just got along. I don't really understand that because, you know, I'd never had a, a child come home with me. I never had, you know, any uh, playmate, nothing like that. And uh, we just got along from the beginning. She had a girl's bicycle, and I got on the bike the first day, and I fell off, and I kept getting on the bike. And then my mother uh, got me, or somehow I got a, a used boy's bicycle, which was too small for me, and I just lived on that bicycle. Oh, my gosh. I can see you now. <laughs> so just so people, the listeners, have an idea, you were born in 1937? Six. 36. So this is 1946. Just so it's mm -hmm. not, you know, 1960 or 1970 and in Oklahoma. So you're talking people with of modest means. Can I ask, did you go to school with bruise marks and beating marks all over you? Or do you, you, did you go to school? Oh, I went to school. Beatings and all of that were on the on one's bottom. I don't, I can't, I can't answer that because we, I really don't remember. I don't remember ever thinking of that. It was just the life I was living. That was just part of it. But two things. One is in those days, the child was just chattel. No one would have interfered. P oh, people had to, well, not just with me. They had witnessed her doing this to these three girls, four girls before me. And uh, so, but no one would interfere. That wouldn't, and people were afraid of her. Uh, and uh, so, mm -mm, I don't remember... You know, there's no school teacher or no um, uh, counselor calling the authorities. Um, and 
she was known and feared. And then it came time to go to high school. And this was so far before anything could even thought of being a woman's movement. I was supposed to go to a high school named Austin. And to be to go to that school, one had to, if it were, you were a girl, you had to put on a kilt. And you had to, during football games, go out and do what I guess you see with so many of the uh, games, of the sports games. I knew that I was not going to do that. So I went to another school, and another thing I cannot tell you, I don't know what address I used. I have no clue. You had to go to school in the district where you lived. And so I didn't. I went to Milby, and I walked into that school, and some of the best people I have ever met in my life, they were intelligent, they were intelligent and smart. They were well-learned. It was just incredible. The uh, president of the student body literally, because we had assembly, the very first thing, he sang operatic arias at assembly, and this was in Houston, Texas. And one of the many blessings is because the people I was around didn't love me and I didn't love them. I didn't want to emulate them, and I've never been drawn to bad people. I have just never, ever had a draw there, and the people that I uh, met in that high school were some of the finest people I've ever known in my life. Are you still in touch with any of your high school friends? Yes, yes. <laughs> How great is that? Two wound up teaching at uh, University of Chicago. Uh, another, uh, a lot of them got PhDs, went on, on to college, which wasn't happening a lot at that time with people in, in, uh, around me, and was head of the history department at Trinity College in San Antonio. Another uh, friend, PhD, she lives in Germany. Her father was Jew, her mother was not, and they had come to, to America after World War II. And she, her name is Ava Marie, she got her PhD in French, wound up uh, marrying a German and living in Germany, and yes, we're still in contact. Uh, yeah, it was just an incredible bunch of people. We were listening to music, classical music, and then film at that time was very important. In 1951, I guess, we would go to the cinema and we would just go in. And it was the middle of the film, that was fine. We'd just go through and stay and see it to that point again. And we went to see The Great Caruso in 1951, walked in, and Lanza was singing Bestie La Juba. I mean, that was my first introduction to, to opera, and that just hooked me right there. And then a film called Pandora and the Flying Dutchman, and in the film, well, it's the whole Flying Dutchman myth and story, also an opera of the same name, and in it is a, it's built around a poem by a Persian poet uh, written in the 10th, 11th century, and an uh, Englishman named Fitzgerald translated into English in um, the late 1900s. So I went to school the next day and had one teacher that really was incredible. She was Phi Beta Kappa. I didn't even know what Phi Beta Kappa was. <laughs> and I said, how can I find this poem? I said, what is it? She said, I won't tell you what it is, but I'll show you how to find out. She took me to the library and showed me how to look it up. So that was just an immense world to me. I mean, they were words, and, you know, Ramadan. I certainly would did not know what Ramadan was. There's several translations of it, editions of it, 101 verses. So I set out memorizing that. Wow. And when I was 15, I really started seriously reading. I mean, uh, you know, the Russians and B.H. Uh, Lawrence. And then just once again, this was all coming in and, and feeding and nourishing me. And in those seven years I lived with my mother, we moved eight times. Wow. So with the husband? With the husband? Or was he gone already? Uh, no, they uh, had a, a 35-year running gun, uh, not gun battle, sorry. Uh, and they even were divorced and married one time in there, but uh, sometime with him and sometime not. And then 
the end of that seven years that I lived with her, uh, because we lived in apartments, very, very small, and I had a bed in, in what was the living room. And then they uh, built a really nice house in a, I'm saying nice, neighborhood, and that was the, the end of living with her. But if you had met her, she was not a floozy, and people would meet her uh, after, as I was uh, an adult. You wouldn't see any of this. She was just a nice, you know, just a nice lady. What are some words that you would describe her other than nice, your mom? Well, uh, I didn't, just, I'm sorry, I said other people would see that. Uh, I guess fragile. I'm trying to, to sort of figure out what it was that made her attractive to And she was not a beauty, but she was pretty. She uh, never, as I said, she didn't dress like a floozy. She just dressed usually in dresses. I don't know if there was something about her that, her uh, fact that she had had suffered so much abuse, I don't know, but there there were men in there. She was married at least at least five times, but twice to to the to, to the same husband I told you of. She was and married so was five just, times, at least. I it, it seemed like there was some other, but uh, at least that. But twice was to the same to the same man. Right and. Uh, Did she so, ever work? But no, if she just looked like an ordinary person. That you wouldn't think that you know that she had abandoned, and that was the word. Uh, at one point, I don't know any more details on this, but I guess she was living in Oklahoma. She was married at that time to a petty officer in the Navy, and there I got the papers. This is an abandoned child, and she was wanting to have me come to New to uh, Oklahoma City, I don't know why, for six weeks or something. And what I heard in little Wilkinson, Oklahoma, was the only reason she even got that six weeks is because the judge that was supposed to hear this, the, the, the case, the bridge was flooded, he could get there, and a, a circuit judge heard the case, and then I went to did go for six weeks to my my mother in this Navy, uh, this petty officer in the Navy for, I guess, a six weeks. That didn't go well. Uh, if, if once again, if you saw her, she doesn't look like a violent person, or a, but she had a temper, and, you know, there was an altercation, and I just, lo- I just sh- locked her out of the house until she got over it. Uh, another one of my blessings was I never, ever wanted to be retaliatory. I never felt any desire to hurt her. Uh, And I think that that is one of the great blessings of of all. Uh, One time she had a hysterectomy and I saw her in the hospital. It was incredible, the the sympathy and and the empathy that I had for her. I certainly never hated her, but I was just having to forge along and with the wonderful people that I met in high school and with the arts, I mean, the, the solace and nourishment through music and through literature, uh, that, that was it. That's what really was the, the steadiness and the, well, the solace and comfort. Is that what healed you, your, your, the arts? I, and see, I never looked in those terms. Okay. Uh, what do I, you say? They just fulfilled you, the arts? Yeah, I, they were that more. They were the, uh, they were the thing that, you know, were, would be words like hope, knowing that more goodness, the best of everything. The wonderful thing is when you go into the Metropolitan Museum of Art, or when you go to you know, to an opera, you're going to hear the very best. I mean, you don't have to have riches to be able to to have the very finest, best things in, 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 the, in the universe. I mean, it, they're, they're just there. And, and to have that idea of excellence, and because of, of my background, then I always wanted the best, but I don't mean to have. I don't mean to to own and possess. It wasn't a question of wanting them in a material way. It was that I I had them through that. And somewhere along the line, I learned that the Metropolitan Opera had the Saturday afternoon broadcast, and uh, I would listen to them. Do you have any idea who your father is? Yes. Uh Uh-huh. His name's on the birth certificate in the same town. 
at the end of his life, he, he died. It, and my mother died within a, a few months of one another, both at age 88, oddly enough to know, uh, because I I got the information from from uh, Oklahoma. And uh, he had several other illegitimate, that's what it was, in those days, that's what it was called, illegitimate children. So he had some other kids uh, that way, too, I think five altogether. Did you ever meet him? Nope. <clears throat> Never saw him. Did you think of ever fight tracking him down? or? When Mother's Day and that sort of thing, for Mother's Day cards, you know, they're sort of hard to buy because many of them is thank you for all the time that you have, you know, <laughs> taken care of me. Oh <laughs> yeah. So I'd have to look. And maybe there were ones. <laughs> Now you'd say they're for a friend, but they'd be, you know, wishing you this day is glorious in every way. It would be something like that I would get. And it didn't even occur to me until a very few years ago. I didn't even think about that for Father's Day card. It was never, ever, ever in my life at all. Well, you didn't have a father. You didn't have a grandfather. Who was a male role model to you? Male or female, I think I mentioned when we talked, uh, when you and I first talked, I can't, I can't think of the first adult role model I had. I guess if we talk about role models, it would be those people that I met in high school. I, they were, I can't think of this, never had a mentor, uh, never had anyone close that was an adult. A teacher, a writing teacher, a music teacher? The one teacher, this Mrs. Moley, what an incredible woman. She was so far ahead of her time. What? Is, how do you spell your teacher's name, Lakita? Her name was Eula, E-U-L-A, Eula, middle initial P, Moley, M-O-H-L-E. And you remember this as though it were yesterday, this woman's name. Yep, and she went to California, and she sent me a postcard. Now, maybe she sent everyone. I don't know. She said, you're one of the people that I thought would enjoy this or something. And that was just... But again, I just took that in stride. I didn't... Maybe it was bigger than I knew it was. Maybe it wasn't big at all. But she certainly seemed... I was in respect, and I just couldn't believe... I mean, she was of uh, she was at the intellectual level of these students I was telling you about, uh, and she had us reading fine things. And she, uh, as I said, she, she was Phi Beta Kappa and wore the Phi Beta Kappa T. And I didn't even know that such an organization existed. So you would hang out with your friends and listen to all this amazing music and poetry and opera, and, and talk. then. And, and, talk, talk, and, and talk, talk and talk and talk and talk. So then, did you dread going home? Oh, I was so much on my. Oh, you can, I can imagine with the, with this running of saying that my mother and her husband was having moving all that time. And then when I was fourteen, I started working, and but I was really I say taking care of my myself. I remember I got it turned out to be uh, mastoiditis. I remember I took myself to the doctor. I can't remember anything I, I, I was doing all that on my own and I just did it it was just like if you told me you'd gone to the dry cleaners today I mean so it was at, 14, just that. I did. at 14 you took yourself to the doc you knew that something was wrong and you had to go to the doctor so you took was, yourself uh, yeah and it was it was behind it didn't that story there right behind your ear and it was really really painful um, but I don't remember ever any, you know, that being any, anything that I would have done with my mother. I don't know how the bills got paid for that. I don't know if I did that. Uh, but uh, I was on, and I started driving early, and I have no idea why. <laughs> how but, early? 16? 15? 13. 13. You said you got your first job. What was your first job? Working in the produce department in a uh, grocery store. Did you get fed at home, or were you always hungry? Oh, I was never. Oh, I, oh, I was never hungry. But, 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 right after I went to Houston, um, I was described as looking like a drowned rat. I only weighed sixty-eight pounds. There was meal served, but I was told I should be so grateful that 
I was being fed and a roof put over my head that it was so resented that I I say I didn't eat. I'm I'm putting that all together from this distance. But um well, who said that I, to you? You should be so grateful. Your mom? My my mother and the man she's married to. Right, that you don't need to eat. You should be so grateful for everything else we're giving you. No, 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 didn't, no, no, the food was there. I'm saying I couldn't eat because it was so, it was so resented that I felt that I, well, it, it, it was resentful that I had, that I should be so grateful for a, just having a roof and, a, and, a, and food on the table, and it just made me not want to eat. I, I, that's all I can say about that. Again, I can totally whatever. understand that. Yeah, I, because I thought, you know, if I was at your house, just if I was at your house, and you went in and said, okay, you know, this is all the food I've got, and I, my children will go hungry, but you can have something. It was so resent. It was so resent. I felt that there was so much resentment to it. And I don't know how long that, that period went on either, because it could have been, you know, forever. No um, child but, should ever be treated like this, right? Well, no. <laughs> no never, no, no, no. ever, it, ever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But again, there was never resentment. There was never wanting to get back at my mother. I, tre- you know, anyone who ever saw her come, you know, to my house, I it would just, they just said, okay, you know, your mother was there and you had the, you know, the, the uh, Thanksgiving or the Christmas or whatever it was. I ne- I knew from that moment when I saw her in the hospital after the hysterectomy, it was just so warm washed over me it was a blanket of compassion that I I say I felt sorry I felt bad it was compassion other than that's the word but I am so grateful that that never was in in of wanting to do a payback or anything I can't tell you how grateful I am for that so would you say that you are who you are today because of or in spite of your mother you see, that means that she had a. It's put that way. <laughs> I don't believe I'm laughing. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not yeah, laughing well, at you, but oh, the I irony here is. No, because it, for, to, to have an influence or no influence it had to be more of a part of. I mean, you would, for instance, you won't ask me if my next door neighbor had an effect on who I am. So it wasn't that she was that much involved in my life that it, that I see it either way. Right, I understand. I think that being whatever I am is, uh, and boy, there's certainly, you know, uh, oh, and I never blamed anything that I've done. When I've done something, it's my responsibility. It's never been because how I was raised. I knew right from wrong and internally, and if I did something that then or now I think was wrong that I shouldn't have done, that's on me. It's yeah, certainly but not that's on what you were them. beaten to think. That's what your grandmother said to you. As a child or a young teen, we're allowed to make mistakes. It's not your responsibility, Lakita, right? Well, I mean, well, I yeah, guess and, you can own the, up to it, but there's a point as a young kid, a young child, a teen, that you can't be responsible for everything. No, and, I'm, and I don't mean that. I'm defending I, I mean, you. I mean, I mean, oh, thank you. Oh, oh good, you do. I wish, yeah, you could have been there a few years back. I but wish I, I had been. No, I think what I, uh, oh, no, I know what I'm saying there is that as an adult, but to go back, no, 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 I will not let anyone off for what was done to that child because then I'd be abusing that child again. I'm really clear on that. When I said I couldn't say, I, when I said my grandmother was clean and that she cooked, uh, I don't like to say anything good about her because that is me not defending that child, and that's what's important to me. I no, agree. no, no. I will never say that was right for that child. Mm-hmm. I will say that as an adult and once I was responsible, that I won't go back and say, oh, because of that, I did this wrong. I, that's what I mean as an, as an adult or whenever I became an adult or whatever line we'd want to touch there. But I do not know. I don't let them off the hook for any of that. And when I said I was so grateful for the compassion of not wanting ever to pay back, that's separate from not 
saying how wrong it was because never anyone who protected me. That there was never one who who protected that child, and that included my mother after I went there, as well as the grandmother. That uh, no one ever protected me. That child. I, I go back and say that. Uh, no. So I no. I don't let any of them off the hook for that. I'm just saying that I do not. I take responsibility for truly everything that I do now and have done since I was whatever age we want or look at is saying, okay, this is when it was, was on me. So, no, that's not an excuse. Whatever has happened to a person, it's not an excuse. It's if inexcusable. They that or, or, or do it past that time. There's mm-hmm. just that moment where one is responsible. I think it's a saving grace that you don't remember any of the brutality and I think it's yeah. a saving grace that you don't harbor uh-huh. resentment um, and the no. negativity and you found the arts. The arts are, is what lifted you up. They filled, it filled your cup. And I, are you spiritual? Because I, Not this at is, all. No. Oh, not at all. I want to make that incredibly clear. I'm non-religious and yet I think that there's a principle through all major religions of doing to others you should have them doing to you. And I certainly have failed at that many times or all the time, but I think that there are, uh, that just would be a good thing for people to, no, 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 I want to really make that clear. I, I certainly think I'm an extremely emotional person. Uh, and at the same time, maybe that is survival. Is that the word? You know, was it survival? But the survival was not at the price of me doing horrible things that I had seen done. It wasn't by uh, repeating and uh, and and replicating what what I had seen that I certainly knew was not right. Well, thank goodness for that. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. That's why I say it's what was given. That's nothing that I went out and intellectually thought about in a long time and made a decision. That was what was given. That was just given. It was there. Just like the compassion for seeing my mother when she was, uh, you know, after that operation. There's other times when I would feel that. Um, And yet not to excuse it, never to use that as an excuse for her either. And there's only one time when, and this was just, you know, I was maybe in my 40s, and she started to almost apologize, and then she said, but she had been through a lot, too, and it just wiped it out. I mean, that was that moment. I don't know what I would have done with it, but if, you know, she just said, I'm sorry, and I knew what, you know, my mother was, but but she had to go and, and to then say, but she had been through a lot. Mm, and, uh, so close yeah. and yet so far away. You don't need an apology from your mother, right? Exactly, exactly. Good for you, good for you. Oh, my goodness, Lakita Vance Watkins. I can't thank you enough for joining me. You certainly have a unique story to tell, and I really appreciate you sharing it with me. And I appreciate your listening. I'm Jackie Tantillo. Don't forget to check out my Should Have Listened to My Mother Facebook page as well as Instagram and more great stories to share next week on Should Have Listened to My Mother. 